Hi everybody and welcome to the start of head work. In this lecture we are going to be reviewing the anatomy of the cranial bones. All right to start the skull is divided into two parts. We have eight cranial bones and we have 14 facial bones. Diving a little bit deeper the cranial bones are then divided into two parts. We have the calvarium, which is pretty much the skull cap. That's going to consist of the frontal, the right and left parietal bones, and the occipital bone. And then we have the floor of the cranium, which is going to consist of the right and left temporals, the sphenoid, and the ethmoid bone. So as you can see in front of you, we have two different views. We have a frontal and a lateral view of the skull. Um, these are very nicely color-coded pictures. It definitely helps you identify uh, where all of the cranial bones are, where the articulations are, etc. So highly suggest using these colored pictures to study. Here's a few more color-coded pictures. The one on the right-hand side is a superior cutaway view, so this really shows the floor of the cranium pretty well. All right, starting with the frontal bone. The frontal bone articulates with four cranial bones. We have the right and left parietals, the sphenoid, and the ethmoid bone. The frontal bone consists of two main parts. We have the squamous or vertical portion, which is pretty much the forehead. And then we have the orbital or the horizontal portion, which forms the, sup the superior part of the orbit. Diving a little bit deeper into the squamous or the vertical portion. Again, this is the portion that forms a patient's forehead. To start, we have the glabella, which is a smooth raised prominence right between um, the eyebrows. We have the superorbital groove, which is the slight depression above each eyebrow. The superorbital margin, or SOM, is the superior rim of each orbit. And then lastly, we have the superorbital foramen, which is a small hole within the superorbital margin. Um, the superorbital nerve and artery do pass through here. Looking a little bit closer into the orbital or horizontal portion, again, this forms the superior part of the orbit. Um, it consists of the superorbital margin, superciliary ridges, the glabella, and the frontal tuberosities. Um, the orbital plate bilaterally forms each superior part of each orbit and then each orbital notch is separated by the ethmoid notch. Moving on to the parietal, parietal bones, the parietal bones articulates with five cranial bones. We have the frontal, the occipital, the temporal, the sphenoid, and the opposite parietal bone. The parietal bones form the lateral walls in part of the roof of the cranium. Something to note, the widest portion of the entire skull is located between the two parietal tubercles of the two parietal bones. As you can see in this picture right here, the parietal tubercle on each side, as you can see, this is the widest portion of a patient's skull on each side. Moving on to the occipital bone, it articulates with six bones, two parietals, two temporals, the sphenoid, and the atlas of the C-spine. It is the most inferior posterior portion of the clavarium. The external surface of the occipital bone presents a rounded part called the squamous portion. The inion is a prominent bump at the inferior portion of the skull. So if you do feel the back of your skull, you will be able to feel um, the inion. The foramen magnum is a large opening at the base of the occipital bone through which the spinal cord passes as it leaves the brain. The condyli portions are oval processes with convex, surfic convex surfaces with one on each side of the foramen magnum. These articulate with the atlas, which then creates the atlanto-occipital joint, um, the two-point articulation between the skull and the cervical spine. 
Moving on to the temporal bone, um, the temporal bones, again, one on each side, they articulate with three cranial bones, uh, the parietal, the occipital, and the sphenoid. Uh, the temporal bones do house the delicate organs of hearing and balance. Um, each temporal bone is divided into three parts, as you can see in this picture. The first part is the squamous portion, which is the thin upper portion that forms the wall of the skull. The mastoid portion, which is posterior to the EAM. Many air cells are located within this mastoid process area. Then we have the petrous portion, which houses the organs of hearing and equilibrium. The upper border of the petrous pyramids are called the petrous ridges, as we can see here. So again, the petrous portion, the upper part is called the petrous ridges. Um, something to note, though, we will be talking a lot about petrous ridges when we do positioning of both the skull and the facial bones. Um, so again, just think of this in the back of your mind when we move forward in doing positioning for the skull and facial bones. This is more a cutout view of the temporal bone. Something to note in this picture um, is the internal acoustic meatus. It serves to transmit the nerves of hearing and balance right here. Moving back to this picture, lastly, I just want to note the zygomatic process. It's an arch that extends anteriorly from the squamous portion of the temporal bone, which meets the temporal process of the zygomatic bone to form the easily palpated zygomatic arch. Moving on to the sphenoid bone. The sphenoid bone articulates with all seven cranial bones. Um, it is a bat look like bat look liking bone with wings. Moving on to more of the anatomy of this sphenoid bone. To start, we have the cella tersica, which is the central depression of the body. Uh, it looks like a saddle from the side, and it's from the derived word Turkish saddle. So as we can see in this picture here, the cella tersica looks like a big saddle. Something to note, the cella tersca does surround and protect the pituitary gland. The dorsum cellae, which is posterior to the cella tersca, or it's the back of the, back of the saddle. So you can see here, cella tersica, dorsum cellae. But if we move to the lateral view, we have the cella tersca and the dorsum cellae is the back portion. Um, another thing to note, the cella tersica and dorsum cellae are, both demonstra are best demonstrated on a lateral skull view. The clivus is a shallow depression that begins on the posterior inferior aspect of the dorsum cellae of the sphenoid bone and extends posteriorly to the foramen magnum at the base of the occipital bone. It also forms a base of support for the pons and the basilar artery. Moving on to an, uh, the sphenoid bone, looking at it more in an oblique view, uh, we're going to start with the lesser wings. Those extend laterally from the body to either side and are triangular in shape, ending medially in the two anterior cl uh, clinoid processes. So again, lesser wings, and then it's extending into the anterior clinoid processes. The posterior clinoid process extends superiorly from the dorsum cellae. So as we can see in this picture, dorsum cellae is right here, posterior clinoid processes, and then the anterior clinoid processes are coming off the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone. Looking at the greater wings, they extend laterally from the sides of the body and form a portion of the floor and the sides of the cranium. Three pairs of small openings exit the greater wings for passage of certain cranial nerves. Those are the foramen rotundum, the foramen ovale, and the foramen spinosum. And in this picture here, you can see all three um, openings, the foramen rotundum, foramen ovale, and the foramen spinosum.
Between the anterior body and the lesser wings are groove-like canals through which the optic nerve and certain arteries pass into the orbital cavity. These, ca these canals begin in the center as the optic groove, which then leads to the optic canal and then ending in the optic foramen. Superorbital fissures are slightly lateral and posterior to the optic foramina. They provide additional communication with the orbits for various cranial nerves and blood vessels. Projecting downward from the inferior surface of the body are four processes that correspond to the legs of the imaginary bat. Um, these all form part of the lateral walls of the nasal cavity. So to start, we have the lateral pterygoid, which is lateral and has a flat extension. We have two medial pterygoids. They're directly medial to the lateral pterygoid process, which ends inferiorly to the pterytory pterygoid hamuli, which end inferiorly in hook-like processes. So if we look at this picture here, um, we have the lateral, we have the medial, and then the hook-like process is the pterygoid process. This picture here is just showing you the sphenoid bone from the frontal um, and a sagittal view. So from the front, you can see the red behind the eyes is where you'd find the sphenoid bone. And then the sagittal view, you can see the brownish bone right here. That's where the sphenoid bone sits right behind the ethmoid bone. Last but not least, we have the ethmoid bone. The ethmoid bone articulates with two cranial bones, the frontal and the sphenoid. It lies primarily below the floor of the cranium. To dive a little bit more into the ethmoid bone, uh, the cribriform plate is a small upper horizontal portion. It contains many small openings of foramina through which segmental branches of the olfactory nerves pass, which are the nerves of smell. The crystagalli uh, projects superiorly from the cribriform plate, which is a derived word from the meaning rooster comb. So crystagalli, think of the top portion. The perpendicular plate is the major portion of the ethmoid bone that lies beneath the floor of the cranium. So a perpendicular plate, pretty much the long plate running right down the middle. Um, it projects downward to the midline to help form the bony septum. The lateral labyrinths are suspended from the undersurface of the cribriform plate on each side of the perpendicular plate. Uh, they contain ethmoid air cells and they help form the medial walls of the orbit and lateral walls of the nasal cavity. The superior and middle nasal conche or turbinates extend medially and downward from the medial wall of each labyrinth and they are thin scroll-like projections. Moving on to the joints of the cranium, or what we call the sutures. So the articulations or joints of the cranium are called sutures. They're classified as a fibrous joint. They are immovable, which then creates them to become synarthrodial type joints. Uh, the coronal suture separates the frontal bone from the two parietal bones. The sagittal suture separates the two parietal bones in the midline. The lambdoidal suture separates the two parietal bones from the occipital bone. And then lastly, the squamosal suture is formed by the inferior junctions of the two parietal bones with the retrospective temporal bone. Each end of the sagittal suture is identified as a point of area with a specific labeled name. The bregma is going to be the anterior end and the lambda is going to be the posterior end. We have what's called a right and left pterion, which are points at the junction of the frontal, parietal, temporal, and greater wing of sphenoid. And then we have the right and left asterions, which are points posterior to the ear where the squamosal and lambdoidal sutures meet. Lastly, I just want to talk about the infant cranium. Uh, so I think we've all heard the word fontanelles before. These are regions where sutures are slower in ossification. They're also called soft spots on a baby's head. The anterior fontanelle is the largest and does not completely close, usually till about 18 months of age. We have a posterior fontanelle. And then we have two sphenoid fontanelles and two mastoid fontanelles.